up in the Himalayas, on the northern fringes of Pakistan, you find some of the most intimidating high mountain peaks on Earth. It's why the great explorer Marco Polo named this place the roof of the world. And below these mighty peaks lie valleys untouched by modern civilization. This is a world where supernatural forces and ancient mysteries control people's daily lives. One valley in particular has captured the imagination of the world. A place so perfect, so harmonious, that it brought health, long life, and enlightenment to all who lived there. To find it, I must climb rugged mountain peaks, cross glaciers and snowfields, as I search for the truth behind Shangri-La. I'm David Adams, and this is the mighty Indus River. It flows from high in the Himalayas down across Pakistan. And up near its source, there's supposed to be a place called Shangri-La. So my search starts in northern Pakistan, a country sandwiched between Afghanistan, India, and China. From Peshawar, I head northwest into the Hindu Kush, then east to the Hunza Valley in the heart of the Himalayas. Peshawar is a frontier city, and that's what its name means, frontier town. anything in Peshawar, and I'm here to do a bit of research. I'm looking for a book called Lost Horizon, a British novel that provides the inspiration for my journey. And in Peshawar, there's a shop that should surely stock books by British authors, the London Book Company. Lost Horizon is an escapist fantasy about a utopia hidden somewhere in the Himalayas. It was written in the 1930s by James Hilton and it quickly became a bestseller. Basically, it's the story of four travelers escaping from war-torn Afghanistan who get lost in the Himalayas. They're rescued and taken to a Buddhist monastery called Shangri-La. There, they find a modern-day utopia, a haven of peace and harmony, a place where people live to be over 200 years old. Their adventure starts in a plain high over the Himalayas. Of course, there was no Shangri-La. Hilton himself claimed it was a fictional place. But with the Western world on the brink of World War II, people wanted to believe it. And so a myth grew up. Maybe Hilton was hiding something. Maybe Shangri-La was inspired by a real valley, somewhere down there. Well, the only clue that James Hilton gives us as to the whereabouts of Shangri-La is to say that the plane flew past K2 and Nanga Parbat, two of the highest mountains in the world. After that, 
would simply disappear. Nanga Parbat is a tantalizing landmark. But for anyone who survived an aeroplane crash in the 1930s, the chances of survival up here would have been slim. They'd have had to trek through deep snow fields and treacherous glaciers. They'd have had to breathe in a rarefied atmosphere at altitudes of 20,000 feet, 6,000 meters or higher. And then there are the crevasses, deep holes below the ice, ravines covered for centuries by ice and snow. From the left side. Yeah. Every footstep must be planned. Every footstep could be your last. Nanga Parbat is the mountain that was James Hilton's last connection with reality. The place where the plane crash of Lost Horizon and the real world come together. Well, we didn't quite make it to the viewpoint of Nanga Parbat. The snow is getting a bit too deep. And I can tell you, it's very cold. I'm sounding a bit funny because my mouth is freezing up. This is about minus 20. This is, without doubt, one of the most extreme places on Earth. But despite these dreadful conditions, people have been coming here for centuries, looking for Shangri-La. The first was Alexander the Great. Two and a half thousand years ago, his armies came in search of the Fountain of Youth. His quest started where mine starts, in the Bomberet Valley, a remote corner of Pakistan, on the border of Afghanistan. This is the home of a remote mountain tribe called the Kalash. It seems a very peaceful life here. Yeah. Before my guide Jinnah takes me to see the living Kalash, he takes me to see the dead. This is what's left of their graveyard, bones and coffins scattered by grave robbers and vandals. The reason? Pakistan is an all-Muslim country, and the Kalash are the last surviving non-Muslim minority. It's very old and it's broken. For a thousand years, their Muslim overlords have called them Kafirs, the non-believers. As a result, they are an oppressed people. This desecrated graveyard, just one example of their persecution. These were not Kalash people who took away the bones? No, no, Kalash don't take. But Islamic people? Yeah. Once 80,000 of them lived in this valley. Today, there are barely two and a half thousand. <laughs> if anything, the Kalash look more European than Pakistani. There's an amazing prevalence of blue eyes and blonde hair amongst them. And there may be a good reason why. They say that even if Alexander the Great didn't find his Shangri-La, some of his soldiers did. They stayed on and intermarried with the Kalash, who still carry their genes. Not only that, but they're remarkably hospitable. 
Any visitor to this valley must drink the obligatory cup of tea. So have you heard of the name Shangri-La? A place called a mystical place called Shangri-La? Yeah, the, the name I know, the Shangri-La is a good place, the people say. One. So do you think it's possible to find it? Shangri-La is very far. Far from here? Yeah. And I've got a long way to yeah, travel. Yeah, maybe it's in the Gilgit side yeah. somewhere. I think it's the special weather. Yeah. So, yeah. so if I'm to find Shangri-La, I must seek elsewhere. I cannot stay long in this beautiful valley. Jinnah is heading south to Chitral, and there's an event on in town that he wants me to see. But there's another, more compelling reason why I must keep moving. As the great snow-clad peaks glow in the alpine light, they send out a chilling warning. Winter is approaching. My search for Shangri-La will be a race against time. As the early snows of the Himalayas threaten to cut me off and imprison me in this remote corner of the Hindu Kush. Every autumn, the wild horsemen of northwest Pakistan put their strength, courage, and horsemanship to the test. This is a game as old as Central Asia itself. It's called Bushkazi, and the object of their attention is a headless, legless goat. I'm in the frontier town of Chitral, up near the Pakistan-Afghan border. This ancient Afghan game isn't for the faint-hearted. Once a horseman has the goat, the opposition does everything in its power to get it off him. Which means a melee of grabbing, struggling horsemen until someone makes a break. As far as I can see, there are few rules. Anything goes. Jinnah tells me a lot of old scores are settled on the Bushkazi field. Bushkazi started as a practice for warriors to pick their wounded comrades from the field of battle. And new heroes are still created with every game. find Shangri-La, I must keep moving. The first autumn snows are already falling, and there's only one road out of the Chitral Valley. Time to hitch a ride. We're just coming up to the Lowry Pass, which is about 2,800 metres high. About four or five months of the year, it's cut off by metres of snow. And that's what makes these valleys so separate from each other and why the cultures are so different, because you just can't travel for many months of the year. It should be open now, even though it's November and the snows have started to fall, but you just never know in this country if you can get through or not. I've now left the Hindu Kush, and I'm entering the Himalayas proper. My destination is the Swat Valley. That's if we ever get over this pass. Yeah. Because of the snow, the road is too narrow for passing. 
And since there's no regulation of traffic up here, vehicles going up come face to face with vehicles going down. And there, they stop and argue. Eventually, they manage to dig away the snow. They tell me that this happens every autumn. It's crazy, but that's the way it is. nearly eight hours to travel just 50 miles, or 80 kilometers. I'm passing through the Swat Valley, which should by rights have had a claim to being the inspiration for Shangri-La, because this valley was the birthplace of Tantric Buddhism. Not that long ago, there were over 1,400 Buddhist monasteries in this one valley alone. Today, Islam holds sway, and the relics of its Buddhist past have suffered accordingly. This is one of the sad realities of this part of the world. This was once a Buddhist civilization, and these uh, sculptures are all over the place. But sadly, because in Islam you can't portray a deity, they stone them, hence all the stones around here. It's uh, one of the sadder things about this part of the world. Where once there was a peaceful Buddha's face, the icons of Western consumerism have been pasted. So how did James Hilton envisage Shangri-La? The words of Lost Horizon come flooding back. Shangri-La was touched with mystery. Listening intently, he could hear gongs and trumpets and also the massed wail of voices. He found the traditions, both Buddhist and Christian, very reassuring. The whole atmosphere was more of wisdom than of learning. The High Lama had skill in telepathy and powers of healing. The monks had discovered the key to longevity, to semi-immortality. 30 or so years after Hilton wrote those words, another group of people searching for Shangri-La flocked to the Swat, the hippies. This was one of the stopping off points on the hippie trail, leading from San Francisco to Kathmandu. In fact, the Swat's always been something of a haven for foreigners. A hundred years ago, the British came seeking relief from bustling towns like Peshawar. It was they who stocked its rivers with trout. My companion, Moham Bar Khan, has benefited from both associations. He likes fish, and he used to run a boarding house catering exclusively to hippies, even if he didn't always approve of them. Woman, like, if woman legs is looking, legs, mm -hmm. this is bad in Islam. When the woman here looking, this also bad in Islam. But if you take your trouser out and you put short trouser and when you walk now, also the people put you stone or say, look, this stupid man. 
So if I was wearing short pants, would they throw stones at yes. me? Yes. And they thinking, because you were a bad man. Yeah. Because like you, like animals, no understand. Go in the street and no clothes. The hippies are long gone. Free love and Islam were never going to mix. Nor were the guns. Two valleys east of the Swat is the town of Bisham. No one bats an eyelid here as gunfire racks the streets. Guns are a way of life. Blood feuds are an institution. These inter-family, inter-tribal battles cause thousands of deaths every year. The penalties of the ancient system magnified a thousand times by the killing power of modern weapons. Machine guns, rifles, shotguns, pistols, all made right here, despite what the labels say. It says made in Italy here. <laughs> Not made in Italy, made in Bisha. They make ammunition here too. It's estimated that 60% of all Pakistani men own a gun. In fact, more children will learn to use a gun here than will finish school. So, a valley that makes so many deadly weapons is hardly a place of harmony and boundless peace. Like the hippies, it's time for me to go. But my next stop is hardly Shangri-La either. I'm about to come face to face with the supernatural at a Pakistani exorcism. I'm high in the Himalayas on the main road linking Pakistan to China of Karakoram Highway. Each year in Pakistan, they hold a competition to see who's got the most beautifully painted truck. Trucking here is a family affair, and each family takes pride in making its truck more gaudy and highly decorated than the next. But there's a religious side to it too. The paintings are spiritual, symbols that will hopefully protect their trucks from the dangers of the road. And it's in one of these mobile art galleries that I hitch a lift up the Karakoram Highway. The highway takes me deep into the Karakoram Ranges, a part of the Himalayas which boasts some of the world's highest peaks. As we drive, I follow the valley of the Indus. In James Hilton's novel, Lost Horizon, Shangri-La was supposed to be somewhere near the source of this great river. So in theory, if I follow the Indus Valley, I should find Shangri-La. At the wheel is a Pathan. My travelling companion is also a Pathan. 
a member of another warlike tribe that lives up near the Afghan border. All across Pakistan, it's the Bataans who dominate the trucking industry. You are first to visit in this area? Uh, yes, yeah. first time. I've, I've travelled in Srinagar, in, in India, in India, and also in Afghanistan, but okay. not up here. Not up here. So do they think that if their, their truck is very beautiful, they will get more business? No, this is no? For not business, this is for the... For pride. For pride, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I've never seen anything like them. They're, they're wonderful trucks. Yeah. They're very comfortable up here too. Huh? Yeah, it's a good way to ride. go, the closer we get to the roof of the world, the lofty Karakoram Ranges, where the world's second highest peak, K2, reaches over 28,000 feet. That's over 8,500 metres. But if I want to get to my spiritual Shangri-La, I must abandon the truck. Where I'm going, there are no roads. As I draw closer to my destination, I'm warned to be careful. The locals believe powerful spirits, fairies, live on the snow line. Keeping on the right side of these fairy spirits is very important indeed. This is a superstitious world. This man is believed to be the subject of a curse. He's not responding to conventional doctor's treatment. He's feverish and his body's racked with pain. So they call in a shaman, a medium who communes with the spirit world. It's hoped he can locate the cause of the problem. <laughs> The shaman inhales smoke from smouldering juniper leaves. <laughs> juniper smoke and deep breathing induces a trance. almost theatrical, not real, but it's not to be taken lightly. People here have an unshakable faith in the supernatural. Those who believe themselves to be cursed often die. All at once, the shaman runs outside. At first, I admit I suspect a trick, but the ground is undisturbed. I watch carefully. How does he know to dig here? Obviously, the shaman thinks there's something here causing the old man's disease. <laughs> and then he finds it, a piece of skull wrapped in a rag, an evil spell placed by an enemy, a curse. <laughs> Thank you. 
But the trance isn't over. He continues his communion with the spirit world until, totally exhausted, he faints. I was told that a few days later, the old man started to show signs of recovery. As for the shaman, his job isn't over yet. Tomorrow, in an extraordinary public seance, he becomes a prophet for the whole village. Maybe through his otherworldly contacts, he can help me find my Shangri-La. <laughs> Much of Pakistan is Islamic in the extreme, but up here, in the country's far north, villagers still often commune with the supernatural. Today the shaman uses his spiritual powers to establish contact with the dreaded mountain spirits. He's trying to find out what they have in store for the village for the rest of the year. I would have to say, I've never photographed anything like this before. I've never seen anything like it anywhere I've travelled. Once more, the juniper smoke does its work, inducing a deep trance in the shaman, who's now hallucinating. In his ecstasy, he translates the fairy prophecy. If he looks sad, the news is bad. If he looks happy, the news is good. Fortunately for the villagers, he looks happy. At pagan rituals like this, they slaughter a goat, and in a macabre twist, the shaman grabs it. Here, the blood of a goat's head is said to be fairy milk. mind to ask the fairies through the shaman if they could help me find Shangri-La, but I guess this was their reply. <laughs> the trance lifts, the shaman leaves his fairy world and is back in the world of reality and totally exhausted. His party may be over, but it's only just starting for the villagers. As he washes the blood from his face, they celebrate the fairy message. It'll be a good season and a prosperous year for the farmers of this valley. As for me, I have an appointment further up the Karakoram Highway, towards the Chinese border. My destination, Gilgit. Gilgit is a town little known outside Pakistan. However, to the locals, it's known as the home of a game which has become associated throughout the world with the rich and famous, polo. Oh, I know, I know. I'm just, uh, I like to get a horse to know me before I get on him. He smells me and he knows me. It's good. Let's just take it down a bit. But you don't have to be rich to play polo in Gilgit. 
You just have to be a good rider. And while I've ridden horses all my life, I've never played polo. Actually, the game had its origins in Persia, but it was Gilgit that gave it its name. Polo means ball in the local language, and hitting a polo isn't easy. Back in the days of the Raj, when the British Army was here, the cavalry officers were captivated by this game. That's how Polo travelled to England, and then on to the rest of the world. But it just doesn't seem to be my game. And it didn't get any better. These guys are just brilliant riders. Come on, David, come on, come on! Come on, come on, come on! Come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up! Make it, make it! So you have to play a forceful shot. Well, at least I got to hit the ball once. Well, I can't say I've done anything like this. Most fantastic game. Just I'm really bad at it. <laughs> I tell my companions why I'm here, to search for the lost valley of Shangri-La. They tell me that they know of a crashed plane near a town called Skardu. Maybe it's the one that inspired James Hilton. According to Hilton's novel, Lost Horizon, Shangri-La was supposed to be near the headwaters of the Indus River. It's also supposed to be somewhere not too far from the mountain Nanga Parbat. That makes Skardu a candidate. This hardly looks like paradise on Earth. The Upper Indus Valley is one of the most barren places I've ever seen. It's also Kashmir, disputed territory, land claimed by both India and Pakistan. A war zone is an unlikely setting for Shangri-La. But it's here, all right. It's a 1970s theme resort. And it's where I'm staying. As we drive closer, there's the remains of the crashed plane I was told about. The buildings have a Buddhist air about them, but closer inspection reveals that my journey is far from over. An out-of-season tourist facility, cashing in on the Lost Horizon myth, might be someone's idea of Shangri-La, but it's hardly mine. You. Mind you, the lake does lend an air of peace, and after 10 days on the road, this tea is wonderfully therapeutic. And as this commercial Shangri-La works its relaxing charms, I plan the last leg of my journey. Tomorrow, I travel to the Hunza Valley, a place where people live to be well over 100 years old, and where I find my own private Shangri-La. Hidden deep in North Pakistan, not far from the world's second highest peak, K2, is Skardu. This remote town is a mecca for climbers. This is where they hire camping and rock climbing equipment before attempting some of the world's highest mountains. And it's not far from here that I hope to find the inspiration for the mythical valley 
of Shangri-La. I've traveled more than 500 miles from Peshawar on the Pakistan-Afghan border. From Skardu, I head north towards the Chinese border, where I enter the Hunza Valley. But first, a game that's penetrated the remotest corners of the old British Empire, cricket. The crew and I are challenged to a match, Australia versus Pakistan. And it's not long before they have us on the ropes. Back in the days when the British Army ruled India and what's now Pakistan, this was literally the ends of the earth. Or the earth as the British knew it some 70 years ago. Below this fort's walls was the known world, cities, order, civilization. Beyond was the great unknown, the setting for James Hilton's Lost Horizon. As you can see, this fort commands quite a presence over the valley. These were actually the, the last bastions of the British. Beyond here, it was unknown. And when James Hilton wrote his book in the 1930s, if anybody traveled even this far, it was eminently possible that a place like Shangri-La could exist because no one knew what lay beyond. So if I'm to find the place that provided James Hilton's inspiration, I must enter this great beyond. The Hunza Valley is on the other side of these ranges. The roads are rocky and few people pass this way, or certainly the way I'm going. And as I enter the valley, I immediately get a sense of the timelessness I'm looking for. So what other clues are there? It's beautiful, and there's an air of peace to it. There's also a great many old people. In fact, the Hunza is legendary for its healthy old population. It's said that up here, people regularly live well past 100 years of age, if not older. But if this is the valley of Shangri-La, there must be a Buddhist monastery. And there it is. At the head of the valley sits a building with a distinctly Buddhist look. A building that fits the description of Shangri-La better than any I'd seen anywhere in the Himalayas. Seeing it first, it was indeed a strange and half-incredible sight. A group of pavilions clung to the mountainside with the chance delicacy of flower petals impaled upon a crag. An austere emotion carried the eye upward to the grey rock bastion above. Under the pavilion-like features of this ancient building, I enter. 
unsure as to what I'll find. Is this a place of enlightenment? Could it be a place that once entered, you never want to leave? I sense I'm alone, and then again, I'm not sure. As I traveled through the narrow corridors and caught glimpses of vistas that showed how beautiful the valley was, I felt that it may well be the place that inspired Shangri-La. In the book, the travelers who finally arrived at Shangri-La always had a sense that they were being watched, that the monks and other residents never had more than a faint physical presence. As I wander the corridors and rooms of this strange, deserted building, I too get a faint sense of the people who once lived here. History relates that this fort was built in the 15th century by a family that ruled the Hunza. When a daughter got married, craftsmen came here from Tibet to create the beautiful building seen today. So perhaps that explains this building that's more fort than monastery. But the question remains, was this the inspiration for James Hilton's fantasy called Shangri-La? As I read on the terrace above the valley, as if by magic, the answer appears. Ijaz is the custodian of this building. He's lived in the Hunza all his life. If anyone knows of its links to the Shangri-La myth, surely he does. Before the arrival of British, this was an independent kingdom. Finally, the British were fearing of a possible Russian movement through this valley down mm -hmm. to India. That is why we had a battle with British troops in December 1891. And so what happened after the British came? Did it, did it change? No, until 1938. Probably this was the time when James Hilton, the writer of... So you think he came here? I suppose he came here. So this might have been what he this designed Shangri-La as... This might have been an inspiration for writing his famous novel. Yeah. Ijaz may believe that James Hilton could have come here, but I'm not so sure. Though, it doesn't matter either way. I set out on this journey knowing that Shangri-La was the invention of a master storyteller. And it does no harm to believe that heaven could exist on Earth. James Hilton believed each of us needed a place like Shangri-La to escape to, even if only in our imagination, a place of hope, a safe haven from the rigors of the world. So for me, this has been as much a search for inner happiness as it's been an external journey to find Shangri-La, my heaven at the ends of the earth.